Hello, everybody, and welcome to this second session of the Law and Sustainability Colloquium hosted by the School of Transnational Law of Peking University. Uh, my name is Stephen Minas. I'm a member of the faculty at uh, the school, and it's a pleasure to welcome everybody uh, to this webinar, uh, which is uh, appropriately enough uh, occurring on the fifth anniversary or thereabouts of the adoption of the Paris Agreement. Uh, the topic we will be discussing today is the, the topic of the question of regime divergence or convergence, the law of the sea and climate change. And I'm delighted that we are able to welcome uh, Dr. Nilifer Oral to make a presentation on this topic. Uh, Nilifer is the director of the Center of International Law at the National University of Singapore, uh, as well as a member of the law faculty at Istanbul Bilgi University, uh, a member of the International Law Commission, a co-chair of the study group on sea level rise in relation to international law, uh, and Nilifer is in a quite unique position in that she has uh, advised the Turkish government on both uh, law of the sea matters and has acted as a negotiator in climate change uh, negotiations. Uh, Nilifer is in addition a distinguished fellow at the Law of the Sea Institute at UC Berkeley. So uh, there is no one better qualified uh, to offer us a presentation on this topic. Uh, can I say that after the presentation, there will be time uh, for questions, and we very much welcome your questions and comments. Uh, and you are in particular welcome to write your questions into the chat box uh, during the uh, presentation, and we'll return to them afterwards. Uh, so Nilifer, you're very welcome indeed, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Stephen, and greetings to all. It's really for me a great honor and pleasure uh, to be part of your program. And so I thank yourself and of course the university for this very kind invitation. And I have to say that um, this is a topic that uh, is something very close to my heart. It's a very important topic. And also because it combines for me at least two issues that uh, I work on. Uh, one is law of the sea and the other is climate change. Um, and as you know, we met often in the climate change negotiations. Uh, I had the privilege of um, being part of the Turkish delegation uh, for the climate change negotiations from 2009 to 2016. And, and of course the famous Paris Agreement. Um, so uh, so it, to me, it's, um, this is a, a, an issue that is great importance and I hope today what I will convey to the students, um, some may or may not be aware of these issues, but I think in the last few years, there has been a growing understanding and attention to climate change and the ocean uh, and the risks that we are facing and what that means. So if you give me a moment, let me get my, um, uh, climb uh, my uh, PowerPoint out here. And I know we have uh, about an hour and a half. I have, a, <laughs> I have quite a few slides, uh, but I certainly will make sure that we have time for questions and answers. Um, so the first part, my title is, hold on, let me see if I can do this, okay. Regime divergence or convergence and, and um, what the point of this title is, is really to look at what seem to be two very independent regimes, the law of the sea regime and the climate change regime. And one is on the ocean and one of course climate change, but we usually associate that with the atmospheric uh, approach. And where are the differences, where are the gaps and is it possible to bring these together? So, um, so first of all, what I'm going to do in the first part is give you uh, some of the scientific background. Although with the caveat, I'm not a scientist. So this is a lay person's understanding of the science. And, um, and I'm sure if we had a scientist, they could give us 
much more uh, information, but I will do my best. And if there are any scientists, I apologize if I've made any errors. But what are the challenges for the ocean from climate change that we'll be looking at? Ocean warming, sea level rise, ocean deoxygenation, ocean acidification, and also what we call ocean chemistry change. And the question is with all these adverse impacts from climate change that we are really now starting to understand more, how can international law respond to the challenges? So this is the big question. Um, so first, as I said, I will look at the science and then the second part of my lecture will focus on the law, of course, the international law aspects. So first of all, I think it's important to understand just the very critical relationship between uh, the ocean. And I have learned also that there's only one ocean. We sometimes say the oceans, because we think of Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, Indian Ocean, but it's really one ocean. So why is the ocean so critical for climate change? Um, well, the ocean really um, is, an important factor in regulating the climate we have. Um, and indeed, the, the climate system we have today is very much dependent on the ocean. In particular, you see um, this, um, uh, it's a current system, and this is what they call the conveyor belt, but it, it circulates. So I should start from the end. The ocean absorbs. Uh, heat from the atmosphere. And that heat then is circulated by this conveyor belt, basically it's a current system that goes all around the planet. And this allows um, for the heat to be distributed, but it also uh, has an impact on the climate system. In fact, that absorption of heat is very important because without it, we would be much hotter in the atmosphere, but it's also one of the factors that is impacting um, the ocean because of climate change. It also, um, the ocean also absorbs um, carbon dioxide that is emitted, and I'm gonna go into more detail about that later on. Um, and, and of course, there's this, as I said, the famous Gulf Stream and, and this is um, the undercurrent that distributes the warmer water. And for example, if that were to change, if there were to be a decrease in temperature, we, and we're looking at the melting glacials, um, that could have an impact, particularly in the Northeast Atlantic, which um, that part, even though they may have cold winters, it would be even colder. And I have to say, that's why we talk about climate change. Yes, there is a warming, um, but it's a change in the climate. So overall, the ocean is absolutely critical to the current climate system that we enjoy now. And remember, it is that climate system which our agriculture depends on, our fisheries depends on, uh, our life depends on. And I think what we're understanding is how critical the ocean is to our life. Um, and this is just the, I think, the more scientific explanation of what I just uh, told you about the conveyor belt. It's called the thermohaline circulation. Um, but again, this is very important for the climate. Um, so uh, again, just some facts, scientific facts. Seawater takes up heat more than 4,000 times as effectively as air and it transport and stores large quantities of heat. So the ocean is absorbing heat that would otherwise stay in the atmosphere. Um, so it has absorbed, the ocean has absorbed 93% of the heat generated uh, through anthropogenic human caused global warming. And this is according to an, a very important IUCN study that was done on ocean warming a few years ago. And if you're interested, I would very much recommend you look at that, gives the science to it. Now, um, uh, so um, as you know, there's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and it is um, scientists from around the world appointed by the governments and certain period periods. Uh, they prepare 
a report. They don't actually do the scientific experiments, but they they uh, review and um, c collaborate on preparing a report on the state of the climate um, that informs the uh, climate change regime. And the last one, they're working on the sixth one now, but the last one was the IPCC fifth report. And this was a report which now started to look at ocean more carefully. And here it tells us that um, ocean warming dominates the increase in energy stored in the climate system, accounting for more than 90% of the energy accumulated between 1971 uh, and 2010. And only 1% of that is stored in the atmosphere. Um, so that just shows you the importance, again, of the ocean. Uh, we also have, because of warming, as you know, the Arctic sea ice um, is per, keeps con melting. And, um, and of course, this is also having an impact on the ocean. Um, also, um, there has been, the, the IPCC report noted that the change in temperature, salinity, sea level, carbon, pH and oxygen. Uh, and one of the important um, adverse impacts that we're learning more about is the change in the pH balance in the ocean directly attributed to the absorption uh, by the ocean of carbon dioxide. And I'm gonna underline this because this is key when we start talking about uh, climate change under the UNFCCC. Then in 2019, this is the first ever um, IPCC special report on oceans in the cryosphere. And just, I took out some parts, a uh, highlight. Uh, since 2005, without stopping unabated, uh, ocean warming has increased since 2005, the rate has increased. Um, carbon emission absorption are causing ocean warming, acidification, and also oxygen loss. What does this mean? This is having a direct impact on marine organisms at all kinds of levels. And with direct impact, and again, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more detail later on, on fisheries, on shellfish, which is impacting food production and livelihood. So everything we talk about is not simply a scientific phenomenon. <clears throat> it's not simply, uh, 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 talking about what's happening to some marine organisms. But remember, the life on earth, our economy, livelihoods, we are very dependent on the ocean. <clears throat> um, so um, I'll, I'll just, I don't wanna read all of this because uh, I realize time goes very quickly. Um, but just like 95% of the near surf surface open ocean has already been impacted by ocean acidification. And that there is growing consensus that the open ocean is losing oxygen overall with very likely loss of uh, 0 0.5 to 3.3% between 1970 and 2002. Then you have what are called oxygen minimum zones. And again, you know, uh, marine life does require oxygen and this is something important. So what you're seeing are oxygen minimum zones developing. <clears throat> um, overall, there are different scenarios um, that are given in the IPCC reports, including the special report on the ocean and cryosphere. One is a low emission scenario and the other is a high emission scenario. That means greenhouse gas emissions. So in terms of warming, um, in the low emission scenario, uh, we're still going to have warming. I mean, that's that's the reality and the bad news. But at least if we keep to basically the Paris, which we'll talk about, warming will only be by two to four times, which is still a lot, frankly. But if we do the high emission, which is the track we're on right now, warming will be five to seven times more. This is devastating. Then we have ocean acidification. Again, um, the we're on a, a this is a track we're on. So it's a question of controlling the level of uh, change in ocean acidification. And I'm gonna give you more information as we go on to just show you how serious this is. So since 1880, that's when we were start, started keeping uh, records. The ocean is warmer today than at any time since we started recording ocean temperature. 
and it keeps increasing. Remember, it's gonna keep increasing. So the question is by how much? And of course, one thing that's to keep in mind, uh, not all parts of the ocean will experience climate change in the same way. Some will have more adverse impacts than others. And unfortunately, the Southern hemisphere tends to be where you'll see more uh, impact, but also the Northeast Atlantic. <clears throat> Another concern is that there is 2.5 gigatons of frozen methane hydrate stored in the seafloor. And methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. Um, I understand that uh, 1 million metric tons of methane is equivalent to 25 to 290. 25 should be metric tons of carbon dioxide. So there's a huge uh, difference. Uh, what happens if that's released? And there is some concern about that. That could be devastating actually as well. Here we see coral reefs. Now, now I'm going to show you what the impact of warming in particular, uh, but other impacts of, of climate change on the ocean. What's so visible and I think really striking is what's happening with coral reefs. Um, so even though uh, coral reefs represent a small part of the Earth's surface, they, they are home to 25%, the habitat of 25% of all marine species. This is an ecosystem which is so uh, critical for the ocean health in general. Um, and, and if we're not just worried about marine resources and, and organisms, Coral reefs are also important to our economy, tourism, food. Um, so it's important to realize that. And healthy reefs uh, are important uh, to protect um, uh, coastal areas from storms. This is one thing that we destroyed our coastal areas. And you know, for example, the devastating tsunami that occurred, I think 2004, 2005, well, one of the factors where they destroyed the mangroves, you know, that protects. So multiple uh, uh, reasons why coral reefs are so important to uh, our livelihoods, but because of climate change, uh, they are being destroyed. Uh, and if I would suggest there's a wonderful documentary called Chasing Coral. And if I would really recommend you watching that because it's a very sad and tragic story of what's happening to coral reef because of climate change. Um, you know, the Great Barrier Reef, um, World Heritage Site, um, they had in 2016, an extreme heat wave, which resulted in the massive death of coral. And, um, and basically, um, this is a quote from nature, Coral on the Great Barrier Reef was cooked during the 2016 marine heat wave. The coral didn't die of starvation. Basically, it was cooked. Um, and so professors are telling us that what this means for the future as well, that you know, the species, marine species in the future are gonna be radically different from what they were two years ago, according to Professor Terry Hughes from James Cook University. And unfortunately, this is not an isolated incident, but um, scientists are telling us that this is the beginning of a long-term transfer transformation uh, of the Great Barrier Reef. And we know that's true. Um, the diagnosis is not good. And again, this is acidification, ocean warming is at least partly to, 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 <clears throat> to be blamed. Um, next, fisheries. Uh, fisheries uh, is, um, over 500 million people depend directly or indirectly, and maybe more frankly, on fisheries and aquaculture for their livelihoods. Uh, Three billion people obtain at least 50% of their animal protein and essential, uh, essential minerals from <clears throat> fish. Um, climate change, it's not about the future, it already is having impact on fisheries and aquaculture <clears throat> as well. So what is that? Um, basically, it's impacting their spawning. Uh, it's impacting migration, distribution, uh, growth rate, feeding, survival, many, many things. And I'm going to now give you some specific examples. Here is a fairly recent study from Rutgers University 
um, looking at the impact of climate change on fish populations. And, um, and here in those areas uh, where it's darker, the darkest color, um, for example, the brown shows that there has been uh, a drop in sustainable yields of fish stock by about 35%. Uh, but on the other hand, you also have winners and some areas it's increasing. And the reason is for ocean warming, fish stocks are migrating. So if they're migrating, some areas are losing fish stock and some areas are gaining that. And this is a trend that will continue. And again, we're talking about not just impacts on the ocean where we don't see the marine life perhaps, but on our daily lives, on the lives of millions, hundreds of millions of people. So um, for the Northeast Atlantic is an example of what the very real impacts are. Um, again, Northeast Atlantic, an area where fisheries is very critical to the, the local economies. And ocean warming started there uh, some years ago already. And, um, and so they witnessed um, uh, migrating fish stocks that are going, because of the ocean warming, you have the fish stocks like mackerel, sardines, they're migrating north to colder water. And this is also important for them, uh, for also the fat content in fish as well. <laughs> so I put this quotation down because it's a bit of a wry humor. Um, Steve Simpson, a marine ecologist at the University of Exeter says, quote, well, I'm optimistic that we can have sustainable and productive fisheries, but they're not going to be the fish we used to catch. It's a changing of the guard. So in England, sardines have replaced herring, cold water loving cod and haddock are heading north and bottom dwelling sole risk being pushed off a cliff. So it's changing. So in 2008, this actually resulted in the Northeast Atlantic in a macro dispute um, because the um, distribution of the Northeast Atlantic mackerel changed um, when they moved from the UK towards Iceland and Faroe. And this created a political row between the countries um, because suddenly uh, Iceland and Faroe Islands were able to catch you know, much more fish stock um, than in the previous, and this caused um, a, a problem. So, and this is just a harbinger for what will come in the future. They were able to resolve it, but I think this is something that policymakers um, have to take into account. Um, our fisheries um, policies, um, places where you have fisheries agreements. Uh, so again, the repercussions are not simply on the numbers, but also very much on real life practicalities. Then we have de deoxygenation, um, increasing warmth of the ocean creates stratification of the ocean and alters the distribution of oxygen. And this means loss of habitats. And remember everything, it's a chain, an ecosystem chain. Um, so, and, and the paradox is the warmer waters increase the animal's met metabolic rates meaning they have to use more oxygen. That means there, there's, it's, a, it's adding to the deoxygenation of the oceans and basically um, it's going to impact and create loss of habitats and ecosystems. Ocean acidification, uh, we're learning more about this. And this is again, is another one of those um, big dangers uh, that we are facing right now. What I'm, everything I'm talking to you about is not the future. It's now, and, and we're on a very dangerous pathway unless we take action. And the question we're gonna be discussing later is how do we take that action from the international law perspective? So um, the ocean uh, has been absorbing about 25% uh, of the carbon dioxide. And again, I underline, this is so important when we start looking at the uh, climate change regime carbon dioxide emissions. Carbon dioxide is the, 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 the cause of ocean acidification. Now, uh, the way it is, is that the ocean would absorb uh, carbon 
carbon dioxide. And if the, uh, um, or I'm sorry, it was more than the atmosphere would release it. And the negative box would be where um, it was uh, more and so it could not release. And that's where we are now. Uh, so the ocean has been absorbing more carbon dioxide and not being able to, to release any, meaning it's becoming more um, uh, acidic. Um, and it's expected that this is going to continue. What does this mean? What does it mean for the ocean to become more acidic, for the pH level to have decreased? Um, what it means essentially is that marine creatures cannot build shell or skeletons, right? They're not able to, to have enough calcium carbonate and that means that their survival level go, uh, re is reduced. And also it will reduce the food chain as well. So what does, so this is um, basically the, the chain they show, but uh, the change in, in pH level means that marine creatures will not be able to produce um, the calcite or aragonite, uh, basically calcium carbonate to build shell. Uh, to build skeletal, and they will not survive. And that means that we're going to see an impact on other um, marine organisms that depend on them. And just to put this into perspective, the National Geographic, uh, to me, this was just striking. For tens of millions of years, Earth's oceans have maintained a relatively stable acidity level. It's within the steady environment that the rich and varied web of life in today's seas has arisen and flourished. But research shows that this ancient balance is being undone by a recent and rapid drop in surface pH that could have devastating global consequences. Over the past 300 million years, I repeat that, 300 million years, Ocean pH has been slightly basic, averaging about 8.2. Today it is around 8.1, a drop of 0.1 pH units. Um, and it's a 25% increase in acidity over the past two centuries. 300 million years we've had a stable pH level, but because of human activities, because of our carbon dioxide emissions, we are altering that. That's why we call this the Anthropocene. This is the period where human activities have changed the geology of the earth. So just to put it, what it means, that means the lobsters won't have shell. Crabs won't have shell. Oysters won't have shell. These are multi-million, maybe multi-billion dollar industries as well. We know that in the, um, for example, in the United States, they're already trying to address the ocean acidification with a multi-million dollar uh, oyster industry, not alone the lobsters as well. And this is around the world. So again, I, I keep making the link. We're not talking about theoretical or uh, invisible uh, impacts. These are, going, these are having direct impacts on all of our lives. Um, and again, just all these are, this is a list of the uh, marine uh, shell life that will be impacted. And, um, and you can see that it's, it's a long list, it's very important. Next is sea level rise, um, and I think many we're all aware of that the melting glaciers and and also the warming ocean, uh, thermal expansion of the ocean means that the sea level is rising, um, and it is impacting communities. Uh, and ironically, those that are farthest away from uh, Greenland and the Arctic, and, and the scientists can tell you why that is. I won't. Um, but we know that, that uh, sea levels are rising. They're rising now, they will continue to rise. And um, there are different scenarios, but it could be an average, and I have to underline an average of up to 1.1 meters. Uh, and that was an, uh, this was the latest information given by the uh, IPCC um, special report on the ocean and cryosphere, 1.1 meters by 2100. But this is an average. Some places will have more, three meters perhaps. Uh, it's very important. And I have to say that the IPCC is considered to be a conservative, conservative estimate. There are other reports that uh, provide much higher estimates, by the way. Uh, and we know that um, 65 million people are living in 
uh, small island developing states, large ocean states, as they also are called, and they are being impacted right now. And the future is very, very uh, grim, uh, as some of them may actually lose entirely their homes. And then Southeast Asia, low-lying coastal areas. Uh, we know that um, this is, the region is a very vulnerable region. What are the adverse impacts here? Well, this has to, this is a legal issue. Loss of maritime zones, loss of baselines, loss of islands. Um, and I will talk about that a little bit more, but it has uh, very, stands have some very serious impacts uh, on certain legal status and what that means for stability, peaceful relations um, and that, and I'll talk about that more. Okay, all right, now it's time finally uh, to get to, and where are we? All right, good, okay. Now let's get to the, the, the legal part. So here we have the, uh, the situation. We have the factual situation on the ground um, concerning climate change and the ocean. So, of course, my, uh, as an international uh, law person, we're looking at, well, what, what, what does the international law framework provide? Um, what, what is it that um, we can do with international law to respond to? What do we mean by respond to? Well, what are the, how can we take measures? How can we have states take the necessary measures um, to actually prevent, uh, to reduce, to control uh, these adverse impacts on the ocean? So, uh, the United Nations system has already expressed, the UN General Assembly has already expressed its serious concern about the effects of climate change on the marine environment and marine biodiversity, uh, including coral reefs, the vulnerability of the environment, fragile ecosystems um, of the polar region in particular, and it has emphasized the urgency of addressing this issue. So this is, and I think if you see the UN Secretary General Guterres, I uh, have to commend him. He has really placed not just climate change, but the whole issue of uh, sea level rise in particular, the impacts it will be having high on the agenda of the United Nations. And, and as um, Stephen mentioned, I'm a member of the um, International Law Committee, uh, Law Commission Study Group on Sea Level Rise. And, and I have to say that um, states uh, have expressed uh, great interest and, and have expressed their great concern for these issues. So that's, that is a positive that there is a political will to take action. But again, the problem is, do we have the legal framework? Do we have the legal foundation um, to take certain actions? So today we're gonna to talk about, what I call it the tale of two regimes. Uh, one, we have, the ocean regime, which of course starts with um, the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention. It's been known and called the Constitution for the Ocean. However, it is a pre-climate era instrument. Um, the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's really, it's over 300 articles. It's very comprehensive. It has an entire section part on protection and preservation of the marine environment. However, it was negotiated before climate change was on the international agenda. So the question is, does it apply to climate change? Um, then on the other hand, we have uh, the 1992 Framework Convention on Climate Change Regime because it includes other instruments. And this was adopted, uh, well, obviously, uh, after climate change was placed on the international agenda. However, at the time, the focus was more atmospheric. Uh, the ocean was given somewhat of a limited uh, role, and partly, and that is because at the time, uh, the understanding of the adverse impact that the ocean wasn't known but today we are learning more about it. So therefore the ocean has a very limited role. So we have an ocean convention that doesn't talk about climate change and we have a climate change regime that has very limited, given very limited space to the ocean. This is, is the divergence. 
And the question then is, well, how can we converge these regimes? Um, so I think I've already, this is the, the dilemma that we have. Um, so basically the UNFCCC um, regime is the framework convention, the Kyoto Protocol that sub was subsequently amended by the Doha Amendment, which is now in force, and of course the Paris Agreement. Under the Law of the Sea regime, we have the convention itself. We also have the 1995 uh, Fistox Agreement. And now uh, the General Assembly, there is an intergovernmental conference um, negotiating almost in the last phase of a new, of a hopefully it will be, uh, internationally legally binding instrument for the conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity uh, in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So here is a new convention that is now being negotiated. It will make mention of climate change, but again, is it enough to address the many multiple serious uh, adverse impacts of climate change on the ocean. So first let's look at the uh, UN climate change regime. So first of all, uh, we're taught the, the UN climate change regime addresses six greenhouse gases. Of course, the principal one is carbon dioxide. Then we have methane, uh, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons, and sulfur hexafluoride, all right? And remember the point I was making earlier is focusing on the carbon dioxide uh, impact specifically and uniquely and exclusively uh, on the ocean, in, in particular for ocean acidification. So the UN U, UNFCCC defines the climate system as the totality of the atmosphere, hydrosphere, biosphere, and geosphere and their interaction. The hydrosphere would include the ocean. So within the definition, the ocean is there. So it's just a question of what is the attention um, that has been given to it. Now, when we look at the ultimate objective of the uh, UNFCCC, the convention, and I have to say it's, it's a bit, it's an interesting uh, objective, but anyway, basically it is the stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations. Remember, so it's all the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system, all right, climate system. And it goes on about the time frame. It also highlights that um, want to ensure that food production is not threatened and also enable economic development. Um, so it's, it's, it's principally atmospheric oriented, although the ocean uh, can be read into this. Um, so, um, so the question is, how would this apply to the ocean in terms of how would it apply to ocean warming? How would it apply to page levels for ocean acidification? Um, what does this mean for adaptation of marine ecosystems? Um, especially when we're talking about these different adverse impacts, again, warming, deoxygenation, acidification, um, change of chemistry, the impact on fisheries, marine life in general. Um, so I'm gonna keep repeating these because this is how we have to be thinking. What does this mean for those specific challenges, those specific risks and harm that we're seeing. Now, um, the UNFCCC, uh, as I said, the, the ocean and the, and the marine environment is there, but very limited. Um, it's basically um, cast in the role of a sink or reservoir. And basically in the sense that sink removing greenhouse gas, in this case would be carbon dioxide, and then storing it, which it has. And we know that, and, we're, and this is why we have the climate system we do, and that warming uh, has not been as accelerated as it otherwise would have been. So under the UNFCCC, under Article 4, which is an article that applies to all parties, um, all parties are to promote the sustainable management and 
promote and cooperate in the conservation and enhancement as appropriate of sinks and reservoirs of all greenhouse gases, okay, not controlled by the Montreal Protocol, including biomass forests and oceans, as well as terrestrial coastal marine ecosystems. So this is where the ocean comes in. Um, now, the UNFCCC um, convention, well, well, there are provisions for adaptation. I would say the principal objective, of course, is to promote uh, mitigation action, particularly for developed states or Annex One and Annex Two states. Um, so here it says that the mitigation, the parties, um, and this is Annex One, um, are to ensure that their aggregate anthropogenic carbon dioxide equivalent of emissions, all right, um, of the greenhouse gases listed in Annex A do not exceed their assigned amounts. Oh, this is the Kyoto Protocol and Doha Amendment, sorry, <laughs> for mitigation. Um, so the point I wanna make here is that it's about carbon dioxide equivalent. It applies to all greenhouse gas emissions. So it could be that the um, mitigation uh, commitments under now Doha, which is in effect, could be met by methane or uh, hydrofluorocarbons. Whereas for the ocean, particularly if we're looking at ocean acidification, it is carbon dioxide, all right? So the carbon dioxide equivalent would not uh, help prevent, reduce um, the impacts on the ocean. So um, then we have the Paris Agreement. And, and here um, there's an extensive uh, preamble in the Paris Agreement. And again, of course, it recognizes the importance of conservation and enhancement of sinks and reservoirs, which would include, again, the ocean and marine ecosystems. And there is one reference to the ocean here, noting the importance of ensuring the integrity of all ecosystems, including oceans. All right. So it's in the preamble. Um, now, Paris was in, uh, important for many reasons, the Paris Agreement. but. What it added to the climate change regime was a specific goal, a temperature goal. Um, and the temperature goal uh, under the Paris Agreement is we know that temperatures are increasing. So the goal is actually at what level to stop the increase. So according to Article 2 of the Paris Agreement, is the goal is to keep the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels, but to pursue efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees centigrade, right? So 1.5 degrees centigrade really um, is the um, ideal. Um, the question is, how do oceans fit into this? Um, how we don't have the information as what the relationship is between this temperature goal and well, okay, ocean warming, it certainly will have an impact on that. Deoxygenation, acidification, not clear. Sea level rise, yes, but has that have, do we have an understanding of what the temperature uh, limits should be for these particular um, adverse impacts. Is there a corollary benchmark for the ocean, right? Particularly uh, concerning the pH level, let's say. Um, also, um, the Paris Agreement Article 2B talks about increasing, again, the ability to adapt. Adaptation is very important. So when we talk about climate change, we have mitigation and adaptation. And one of the important contributions of the Paris Agreement was really to put them on equal footage. So again, here, increasing the ability to adapt to the adverse impacts of climate change, foster climate resilience, and low greenhouse gas emissions development in a manner that does not threaten food production. In a manner that does not that threaten food production, well, what about the fisheries that are being impacted because of ocean acidification, ocean warming, isn't that already being threatened? Um, so again, where does the ocean fit into this? It's not clear. We don't have uh, a framework for this yet. 
Um, now, Article 4, of course, basically um, has um, includes uh, an objective for states to select a time period for when their greenhouse gas should peak. And, um, and it should be as soon as possible. So when we're talking about peaking of all greenhouse gas emissions again, um, the question is, if it's applying to all greenhouse gas emissions, should there have been a peaking of carbon dioxide emissions? And it may be that most of it will be carbon dioxide, uh, but the framework isn't, isn't made this way um, because we need to be able to link it, the, this peaking uh, specifically to the adverse impacts on the oceans. And we don't have that yet. Uh, and I'll get to where I think perhaps we're moving in that direction. So is there a peaking limit that can be linked to the ocean? Um, now, the climate change regime overall, and understandably, there's reasons for that, has given a great deal of attention to land use um, and, and also forests and deforest deforestation. Um, there's the whole um, uh, red and red plus program. And Paris Agreement, once again, highlights that, where under Article 5, it specifically talks about um, conserving, enhancing um, reservoirs and greenhouse gases in relation to forests, all right? Um, so there's no doubt we know that trees are very, they store carbon dioxide and when they're destroyed or cut down, they release that. Um, and, and so there's no doubt that the ocean will also benefit from this. And, and, the, and in Article 5.2, it talks really promoting incentivizing um, activities that will prevent deforestation. We don't have an equivalent for the ocean. We don't have an equivalent for preventing um, acidification, um, warming, um, deoxygenation. And that's, that's a point I want to make that the, it's very terrestrial orientation, the Paris Agreement. And again, this applies to adaptation, um, again, parties are to increase their ability to adapt um, to the impacts of climate change and, and foster climate resilience. And of course, um, this is broad language, but what we don't have is a clear framework of how it would apply to the ocean. And this is definitely um, a gap. We need to have that clarity. We need to have that framework and we need to have action being taken on that. Now, where we see some movement happening in this area um, is in the nationally determined contributions. <clears throat> so um, Paris, um, I'm gonna have to speed up. I realize time is going quickly. So uh, Paris is an interesting, uh, and I know you probably may already have knowledge about this, but one thing it introduced was um, for states, all states, and that was what was important, not just the developed states, but all states, to take mitigation measures, but they could determine it on their own through what we what was called nationally determined contributions. And this could also include adaptation measures. Um, and so this, all states uh, were required to, to um, submit these. And, and even though there was no requirement to make mention to ocean or the marine environment, many of them did actually. And there is a, a, a scientific article written about this um, in 2017. And it showed that of uh, 161 governments that had filed nationally determined contributions, 70% included some mention of marine issues. Um, and they basically focused particularly in adaptation needs, more on the coastal impacts, mangrove conservations and coral reefs. So the good news I think is that states have be, are aware and they have included in the nationally determined contributions, but what will that mean though? Because those nationally determined contributions will be part of a stock taking. The first one will take place in 2023, which is not that far off now. And the question is, will the ocean factor be taken into account in that global stock taking. That is not clear yet. Um, so um, again, yes, and adaptation planning. Uh, each party shall, okay, there's a requirement to do adaptation planning. And again, again, I'm asking the questions. 
um, how shall the climate change impact on ocean ecosystems be included in this assessment? And should it be required again um, uh, in part of the whole system that's being developed under, under Paris? And I mentioned the stock taking. Um, and one of the questions, of course, is what will be the indicator? Okay, what is the indicator that will be used? Now, the Paris Agreement, um, the, well, I should say the, the UNFCCC, Paris, Kyoto, so they have annual meetings, conference of the parties, meeting of the parties, meeting of the agreement. And in, in COP23, which was the Fiji presidency, this was the beginning for when finally the ocean started gaining the attention it should be. And in COP23, um, they launched the ocean pathway towards an ocean inclusive UNFCCC process. <clears throat> and also the Tanoa Dialogue for the NDCs. And so here it is, a, it, the idea was a two-track strategy to increase the role of the ocean considerations, particularly in the temperature goal for the Paris Agreement and increase um, action priority areas impacting ocean and climate change. <clears throat> Last year, they had a meeting in Madrid and, um, and, the, and the ocean issue has been taken up by the subsidiary body for scientific technological advice. I'm gonna go quickly. Just, uh, was it last week? Um, based on a decision taken in Madrid, which should have been Chile at COP25, um, they held climate dialogues and very encouraging to see that the ocean climate nexus was given priority. And next meeting in Glasgow, it promises to be the blue COP, the ocean COP, and I hope so. So, <clears throat> so we see that um, there is efforts being made. Excuse me. Now I'm going to talk in the time we have, of course, get now to the Law of the Sea Convention. Remember, the Law of the Sea Convention, which is a pre-climate change convention, but constitution for the oceans. And in the preamble, we see that um, what it's what's envisioned is the, is the creation of a legal order for the seas and oceans that includes the conservation of the living resources, uh, protection, preservation of the marine environment. And I think this is one of the great contributions of the convention was the detail, the clear obligations uh, that were created for states uh, in part 12 in particular for the marine environment. Article 192, Unqualified states of the obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment applies to all areas of the ocean. It's a direct obligation. Does this include climate change impact? I see no reason why not. And we'll show why, absolutely. Um, first of all, um, a lot of, at that time, of course, pollution was a big priority. And so you see a lot of, um, there's a lot of pollution language in the convention. But what's interesting when you look at the definition of pollution, it's very broad. It's the introduction by, well, humans will say now, directly or indirectly of substances or energy into the marine environment, which results or is likely to result in deleterious effects, meaning adverse effects, uh, harm to living resources and includes harm to humans, health, et cetera. It's carbon dioxide pollution, certainly seem to fit this, um, uh, this definition, particularly once we've gone over the threshold and after 300 million years, we see a change in pH balance. Mm, I would think so. What about the other greenhouse gases? Um, certainly, ocean warming, sea level rise, deoxygenation, these are all deleterious effects. So I think it's pretty clear. Next, we go to the obligations, all right? And, and this is where um, the co convention is important because it really sets out very clear obligations that we don't have uh, in the UNFCCC vis-a-vis -vis the ocean. So under one, Article 194, states have the duty to adopt necessary measures to prevent, reduce, and control pollution from any source. It's absolutely limitless, any source including transboundary pollution. The duty to adopt measures to prevent transboundary pollution, climate change is transboundary, 
all sources of pollution from activities under the jurisdiction or control of states, all states. Uh, also, paragraph five of Article 94 includes the duty to protect rare or fragile ecosystems, habitat or depleted, threatened or endangered species and other forms of marine life, all right? Coral reefs, uh, uh, any, any endangered uh, marine life would fall under this. It's quite clear that through just, you don't have to do stretch the imagination that climate change would certainly fit into this as a transboundary source of pollution. It is a source of harm to, source of pollution um, to the uh, marine environment. Um, so, and if the states, all states have the duty to protect the ocean, including the rare and fragile ecosystems, um, how does this transpose to the climate change? All right, how do we implement this? So, um, one thing that's important um, is in terms of what the obligation to ensure as well means. We have direct obligations of result and those to ensure. And um, the ICJ, but we also have the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea and its two advisory opinions, gave us a very clear um, outline of what that duty is. You have to, states have to adopt the appropriate rules and measures exercise vigilance and uh, of these measures and their enforcement, and also monitor the activities of private and public operators. And this was had to do with the um, seabed mining. Um, so would this apply to um, uh, those activities under the jurisdiction control of states, such as carbon dioxide emitting power generators that use oil or coal? Why not? Um, also under Article 197, states have um, a duty. I mean, it's not qualified. States have a duty to cooperate. This includes on a global basis um, or, um, or on a regional basis, but anyway, directly or through competent international organizations in formulating and elaborating international rules, standards, and recommended practices goes on uh, for the protection and preservation of the marine environment goes on. Well, would this not apply to, as an obligation for states to cooperate through the UNFCCC system to formulate and elaborate those international rules, standards, and recommended practices, that climate ocean nexus in order to protect and preserve the marine environment? Again, so the, 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 the Law of the Sea Convention really is, is, is a, a remarkable convention. It still is the only, it's amazing, the only global convention that has binding commitments applying to land-based sources of, of um, pollution. And climate change is clearly land-based. And here it states that states have the duty to protect against land-based sources of pollution of the marine environment. Um, they have the duty to adopt laws and regulation to prevent pollution of the marine environment through the atmosphere as well. Um, does this apply to duty to create mitigation against land-based activities that impact the ocean? Why not? It seems to me it would, uh, particularly if we accept that carbon dioxide uh, does constitute a pollution as it does create deleterious uh, impact to the marine environment. Let's also look at marine living resources. Um, now here's where we have some problems. Um, Article 61 of the convention, um, the obligations that are imposed upon states concerning conservation and management marine living resources is really more about preventing over exploitation, all right? And when we look at the climate change linkage, when, it, when we're talking about fisheries, for example, or other marine living, <clears throat> other marine organisms. Um, it's not a question of overexploitation. Um, so here we have 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 a gap. Um, so I think this is an area that uh, the convention, uh, the Law of the Sea Convention, at least specifically in this area, doesn't directly address. The same is with the fish stocks agreement for straddling and highly migratory stocks. Uh, the objective is to ensure the long-term sustainability. Um, and so 
and it is about maintaining or restoring stocks. Um, and there is a duty to assess the impacts of fishing and other human activities on environmental factors. So perhaps, uh, at least in relation to um, the scope of applicability of this agreement, there could be some room to interpret um, climate change into it, uh, such as remember the problem with the Northeast Atlantic macro. Now very quickly on sea level rise, because I do want to leave time for your questions. Um, so from the, there are many impacts of sea level rise, but on the law of the sea aspect, what we're looking at specifically is the impact it has to maritime zones and entitlements. All these maritime zones you see derive from one source, a baseline, um, a baseline that is established for the territorial sea. But that baseline is often established on very small or ephemeral features that are highly susceptible to sea level rise. And the question that arises is if those base points uh, upon which the baseline is measured disappear, what happens? Uh, is there an obligation of the state to have to adjust the baseline, come up with a new one, which means that all these maritime zones will shift inland. And that can have a huge impact on many issues economically, but also relations with other states. Um, and particularly when we're looking at the exclusive economic zone, um, which is, uh, has you know, fisheries. Uh, there, you know, it's just, just such an important um, uh, area for many states, but particularly um, the we'll call large ocean uh, island states uh, who can have vast economic, um, exclusive economic zones. But if they lose an island and they have to change their baseline, then that can alter everything. So the Law of the Sea Convention isn't clear about this. Uh, and, and this is a, an issue that's been taken up by the International Law Commission, but also the International Law Association has also done very good work on that. Archipelagos. Um, so is a complicated formula, but again, it rests on an island or atoll or coral. Uh, and if one of those um, offshore features that allows an archipelagic state to draw with it, use an archipelagic baseline and be able to enclose a vast area of ocean space is lost. They could lose that ocean space. And again, this can have devastating impacts in many ways uh, from economics, fisheries, navigation. Um, and so um, these are some of the issues that we have to tackle with. We know sea level rise is happening now. We know islands are already disappearing. And the Law of the Sea Convention has a rather cryptic definition of what's an island, what's a rock, and what's important for purposes of sea level rise is that uh, an, a rock does not, is not entitled to an exclusive economic zone or continental shelf. And the definition of a rock is an island that cannot sustain human habitation or an economic life of its own. What happens when, because of sea level rise, due to climate change, um, it's not simply that the island has to disappear, but can no longer be liv livable because sea level sea has entered into the freshwater sources, so it's no longer habitable. Is it now a rock? Does that mean now that that island that once was entitled to an exclusive economic zone will lose it? Will it devolve into a rock legally? Um, so these are questions that we are still looking for answers. And the reason I raise that now in terms of climate change as well, is this also an adaptation issue, all right? How does international law adapt to this? Um, does the UFCCC have any role in this? Um, so I have come basically, I think, to the end of my presentation where I hope I've laid out um, what the threats are, what, where, what the dangers and the harm that climate change now um, is uh, uh, producing for the ocean. The existing two key legal regimes. And at this point, they are not interlinked 
but can they be interlinked? How can we converge them? Um, because I think there is room, but it's a question of what's the mechanism uh, for doing this? Is it simply relying on state obligations? Um, for example, I mean, to me, the law of the sea convention certainly does create very clear obligations, and these obligations could be um, implemented under the UNFCCC, but how would you do that? Um, so I think I probably at, will ask more questions than answer. So I think we now have some time for um, some question and answer and comments on this. Uh, and I look forward to, to your comments, thoughts. And if you have questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Again, I'm not a scientist, so not too many science questions, please. All right, so here are my conclusions. Um, but anyway, thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nilifer, for that extraordinary presentation. I think it's it's clear that there is a lot of legal material here and that these, these two challenges, the ocean and the climate are so inextricably linked. Uh, but we're also confronting this challenge, which comes from the, the simple fact of when the respective laws were drafted and what was on the agenda then and what was known then. Uh, and here we are in 2020, soon 2021, having to, having to make sense of it. So thank you very much. Um, the questions that we need to be thinking about for sure. Um, so the floor is now open for questions, and you are very welcome uh, to write your question in the chat box. Uh, you're also welcome to put your hand up uh, as, as Zoom allows and ask a question. I should note that we are recording this session and we do intend to publish it on YouTube. So uh, if you're comfortable being in the recording, uh, you're welcome to ask a question. Otherwise, uh, you can anonymously uh, submit a question. Uh, via chat. So, so the floor is indeed open. Um, and, and just while we uh, await for questions, uh, Nila, for perhaps I could make one observation uh, listening uh, to your presentation. Um, you mentioned how different the, the, the climate treaties and the law of the sea convention are in various ways. And, and one of the additional major differences that struck me, apart from their respective lengths, of course, is the, uh, the nature of their dispute settlement uh, mechanisms. And uh, the, the law of the sea convention, of course, has a very robust uh, compulsory dispute settlement mechanism. Uh, the climate uh, treaties, not so much. Um, so do you think looking at, at how the, uh, the law of the sea broadly can contribute uh, to the response to climate change and ocean acidification, do you think there is a role for interstate dispute resolution or, or perhaps indeed a role for the advisory <laughs> jurisdiction in this regard? Uh, Stephen, that is an excellent question, very relevant question and a timely one. <clears throat> because indeed the Law of the Sea Convention, um, in addition to part 12, part 15 on the settlement dispute, compulsory settlement dispute provisions is pretty extraordinary when we look back now in particular. <laughs> um, and so there are many avenues um, for states if they wish to, to um, state parties, I should say, of course, to, in, to, to bring um, um, a case now. Um, so two, one would be, you know, an actual dispute, and then you raise the other one, an advisory opinion. So, and added to this, um, so yes, a state could bring a case, uh, but it would be basically, you know, who would be the other side and, and what exactly would be the issue. Um, it's, it, you know, the issue of causation, um, is, is a sensitive one. One, uh, would the courts be able to get into that? The science could be quite complicated. Um, so it would really have to be focusing on what would be the issue. Now, um, it could be, and as I said, Article uh, 194, 197, those are obligations that are pretty concrete that could be challenged in the sense of, well, particularly the states that are responsible for most of the carbon dioxide emissions, um, whether they're taking adequate measures 
um, to prevent, reduce, and control pollution. Um, those standards, and I think the due diligence standard, that could be a question, an issue broad. Um, as well as Article 197, you know, implementing that duty to cooperate through an international organization, that could be. What the result is, I don't know. Uh, we also know that um, in terms of um, obligations of the marine environment, there, is, there seems to be some pretty good jurisprudence. It's an obligation ergo omnis as well. Um, so that raises the issue of, you know, that's an obligation that applies to all states, uh, meaning there's a, that gives standing as well. So very interesting um, issues. But I think what's looked at more is the possibility of advisory opinion. Um, and, and I know there's a lot of discussion that's gone on about that groups meeting, um, some looking to whether to bring it on to ICJ or ITLAS, but ITLAS certainly be, because of its existing, um, well, under part 15, only for uh, the seabed chambers does it provide for advisory opinion. But we know that under the ITLAS statute and regulations and the IUU, I mean, the fisheries case advisory opinion that if there's a separate agreement uh, to bring a case to for advisory agreement uh, opinion that that can be done. And that could be done. And particularly when we're talking about the status of baselines, the status of islands, they turn into rocks or whether there is an obligation under 194, 197. I think an advisory opinion would be excellent really to, to bring some clarity to this. And it would might facilitate action as well because as you know, your experience in climate change, political will is key to this. Absolutely, and uh, and political will, I think, is is one of the questions today. And I was I was very pleased that you mentioned the ocean and climate dialogue. So this, of course, was a direct mandate from COP twenty five, uh, and hopefully this will be followed through. Uh, I see there is a, a question in the chat box. Uh, asking uh, for the sharing of the uh, recording link. So of course, once, once the recording is public, we'll be delighted uh, to share that. Uh, a substantive question uh, also uh, here. The role of scientific experts is increasingly important in the discourse of law of the sea and international environmental law. According to your experience in negotiating relevant treaties, how do you view the interaction between independent scientific experts and the representatives of governments in the lawmaking process. Thank you. Is that from Peshwan, the question? <laughs> um, yes. So if there's one area where science is critical, it's ocean and climate change, well, climate change in general, of course, and that's why we have the IPCC and, um, and certainly the uh, the expert information, expert input is essential. And the special report on the ocean and cryosphere for this reason was really groundbreaking. Uh, if anything, to at least um, really raise that awareness level. But in terms of the negotiations, it's, I, I was um, actually just had the, um, uh, participated uh, in a seminar where we talked about the, this, um, it's called science diplomacy. And, and it includes uh, how scientists uh, can be part of the um, diplomatic process, international relation process, because if we're going to be um, taking the right legal action or policy action in climate change and protecting the ocean, we have to have the right science for this. Um, but, but um, how that works into the actual negotiations, either delegations can have it on their um, own you know, member teams. But I'm gonna raise another difference between the law of the sea convention and of course the climate change regime. And it's the, the existence of subsidiary permits as subsidiary bodies. And we know we have the subsidiary body on science and technology advice under the, the climate change regime which ideally that's the role also being played is to feed in the science. We don't have that under the law of the sea convention. 
Um, so the use of experts is very ad hoc for that reason. Um, anyway, I don't know if, if that fully answered the question, but it's a very important question. And I think it's becoming more and more discussed, this interplay between science experts um, and policymaking and international lawmaking. We also see that in the international courts and tribunals as well. Indeed, and the, the difference regarding the institutional setup of the ocean and climate regimes is another, uh, another interesting contrast that you make. And, and regarding the role of science and the scientists, I was very struck by your comment uh, that we don't really know as well as we would like to what the temperature or how the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement translate into impacts on the ocean. Uh, so perhaps this is an area where a further dedicated um, scientific work is required, uh, but also from a, from a uh, perspective of states, uh, an application of the precautionary principle here, that this is a remaining area of um, uncertainty. Yes, and here again, so again, when we do this contrast between the two regimes, you know, the climate change regime does include precaution. Um, the Law of the Sea Convention does not, expressly at least, um, except the, the Fish Stocks Agreement does. Um, but so again, um, it is important, um, but how it would apply. So yes, you raise good points as well. So the, the floor is still open for questions. I see um, students as well as some faculty colleagues who are very welcome as, as well as others. So everyone is in, uh, entirely welcome uh, to ask a question. Uh, but I, I see there's a question here. Um, how can we motivate developing countries from where the largest portion of carbon dioxide will come in the future, given the fact that the largest per capita carbon emitter country, the United States, withdrew from the Paris Agreement? Well, boy, that's a million dollar question right there. Or maybe in today it's billion. <laughs> uh, how do we motivate develop developed countries? Uh, this is where Paris, the Paris Agreement um, is really landmark in, a, in that it really, the whole point was to create a very inclusive collective effort for all states um, to contribute to mitigation. And so the big test uh, will be in 2023, which is not that far off to see, you know, in the global stock taking. And how to motivate, um, well, you know, it's, that's, the, in reality, the, the climate, regime, the climate negotiations were very much the economic issues were key. And so I think we really have to make clear that the zero carbon pathway, um, the main motivation should be that this is the way the future development model. Innovation, Stephen, you're on the technology committee, so important. Um, and, and we see that there's a really a very strong social movement now from, from um, de, de investment, is that what it's called anyway, from carbon producing industries, you know, oil, oil and gas. Um, so I think that if um, it's made, it's very clear that future growth is going to be green growth, right? Uh, I would hope that that would motivate, but I realize too, that there are challenges. Uh, unfortunately, you know, many developing countries rely on the developed countries too on coal. Um, so this is also something for, you know, the climate finance. Um, one thing I'm not clear about, and I think that's still up in the air, is, you know, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. Um, the Kyoto, of course, had the um, clean development mechanism, which I think, you um, the intent was really exactly to motivate, motivate developing countries um, through this interaction with developed countries to get into cleaner energy. But I think that that is a gap right now and we really need to be working on that. Uh, there's no question that we have to have clean 
uh, no coal, non-petroleum, non-carbon uh, energy sources. So it's a good question. I don't know if I, I have the answer really, but it's something I'll think about more. So, and, and the good news is, is that US will be coming back. <laughs> Pretty clear. Exactly. You know, exactly Biden. Right. <laughs> so they'll be now, back. Now, in, he, in now he just needs to convince the Senate to ratify the law of the sea convention and, uh, <laughs> and they'll be in all the relevant uh, so. Indeed. But um, there's, there's another question here, Nilifa. Uh, I'm wondering your opinions about the international legal principles applicable to the evacuation, relocation, and migration abroad of persons. Um, caused by the adverse effects of sea level rise? So, um, so I, this is something of course that um, is being looked at very much. So um, one by the International Law Commission Study Group, my colleague um, who's one of the co-chairs, uh, Patricia Gavalatalos, um, she's actually um, examining, studying this particular issue. This is not my area of expertise. The International Law Association as well. Um, and I know that, um, so first of all, I would say this, the goal really should be is to first look at how we can keep people, to prevent migration, right? For prevent relocation, uh, you know, keeping, keeping, um, them, you know, and, and that's very difficult. Uh, and this is a, a, a huge adaptation issue right there. Um, one issue that we, that's taking place is this whole movement toward artificial islands. And I don't know how many of you know, but for example, the Maldives is building an entirely new uh, capital, Hulhomali, an artificial island. There's a whole industry growing about this. It's a bit controversial, um, many levels, very expensive. On the other hand though, it is a way to prevent relocation perhaps. Um, but we can say that as it is, as we see today, that um, there's lack of international solidarity on, on welcoming people, migrants, or, and I know there's a whole different terminology on this. I think we're extremely unprepared uh, a lot of it will, the, the relocation actually will happen internally. So a lot of this will be, um, um, much of this will be internally. And so states have to be internally prepared for this. Um, the International Law Commission also um, has prepared uh, a draft set of articles on the protection of persons in the event of disasters. And it includes uh, slow onset uh, events or disasters such as sea level rise. And so there are principles in there as well. And the key principle is cooperation, right? States have to cooperate. Uh, what does that mean exactly? Um, so they need to be able to provide support, solidarity, um, funding. We don't have the mechanism yet for this. So, so it's not my area of expertise. So I'm just kind of giving some thoughts, sharing some thoughts with you. And I think on a very critical uh, problem and we, are, we have yet to see it. We're already not prepared for people relocating as it is. Uh, and so this is a, another potential disaster in the making. Yes, I see that Xiao Tong is asking for the floor. So Xiao Tong, you're very welcome to ask a question. Um, thank you. And thank you, Professor, for your uh, presentation. Uh, so I've noticed that uh, since they mentioned about the principles, uh, I couldn't help but notice that there's uh, also the principle in the new uh, BBNJ draft agreement, which also mentioned about uh, the um, climate change and ocean acidification and also restored ecosystem integrity in uh, 2019 revised BBNJ draft. And also in article uh, 14 and 16 and also in annex, uh, there's also written about the climate change and the acidification uh, clause. So I was wondering that uh, why it was, uh, it written in the 
sector three, error-based management tools, including marine productive areas, what role uh, will be like to adopt it in this clause in, in the MPA? And uh, what specific measures could be adopted if such agreement uh, uh, success in the end, like in the final, in the final agreement? Um, so that's my question. Thank you. Well, that's a great question. And you are clearly following the BBNJ and negotiations very carefully. So uh, I thank you so much. Um, and, uh, and you really pinpointed um, an area. So, so one way again is like how to incorporate the climate change issue, which is ultimately a land-based issue into the BBNJ, which is areas around national jurisdiction. And the reason it's in that particular part is that the science tells us, again, we're informed by science, that a healthy ocean will be more resilient uh, to uh, the adverse impacts of climate change. And that protected areas, um, uh, marine protected areas that are well managed. And of course, when we're talking about the high seas, this will be a big area. There are questions of interconnectedness, but it will be important, very key in building the ocean resilience as well. So for example, we want to build up the oxygen level of the ocean, very important. Um, so it will play, my understanding is that one of, that is one of the important reasons to, to include climate change. And again, another important factor for why um, area-based management tools such as marine protected areas can play a very important role in uh, climate change. But I should also add um, to this, another area, of course, where it could come in is environmental impact assessments. Um, and again, you know, how to draw that linkage between the land to the high seas and taking into account um, activities that occur in land um, that would cause those carbon dioxide emissions deleterious to the high seas is another issue. Now, negotiations are difficult. And, um, and as Stephen also knows from the climate change, uh, states are, are reluctant to give up certain economic rights as well. Um, but, so this is how I think that there's an effort being made to draw that link between climate change and BBNJ, but in particular in building the ocean resilience, the health of the oceans, the marine ecosystems, uh, fish stocks, all of these um, in that particular part. So thank you very much for that excellent question. Nilifer, there is one final question and it is uh, asking about your opinion on the prospects uh, for legally freezing baselines and um, mar maritime entitlements uh, in the face of sea level rise. All right, great. Perfect final question, because that is certainly um, high on our agenda uh, in our work in the International Law Commission. Um, so one is the terminology. I think the, the ILA decided not to use freezing, but maintaining. The view I give right now is completely my own personal view. I should say that I'm not giving the view of the commission or the study group because the work is still in progress. Um, but what, to be quite honest, um, the convention doesn't uh, require that baselines have to move. It's an interpretation uh, of the convention. There is some state practice, uh, but when you look at, and if you're interested in this topic, I suggest you look at the comments that have been made by states. One, um, in the past when this issue was placed on the, long, on the um, current agenda of the commission, the comments from states in the sixth committee even for the very few who had some hesitations about the commission taking this up. I would say it's pretty well consensus unanimous, the importance of maintaining stability, certainty and peaceful relations. And that translates into maintaining existing lawful boundaries, right? 
Um, so I think that the prospect for uh, adopting some kind of, you know, agreement, consensus, how it will be in recognizing um, that existing, and I think the key is to make sure though that they're lawfully, they've been internationally recognized, uh, existing boundaries and entitlements, there's a good chance for that. I really do. I'm quite optimistic on that score. Well, thank you again, Nila, for uh, this has been an extraordinary discussion. And I think uh, you've shown us some reasons why a cohesive approach from international law to the ocean climate nexus is so important. And, uh, and these foundational treaties uh, on the law of the seaside, but also the climate change side uh, have a huge role to play. Uh, so thanks again, and also for being so generous with your time. Thank you, Stephen. It was a delight for me. I'm very pleased uh, to have been part of this and, and, and given the opportunity to share what I think is really such a critical issue that for all of us. So thank you and uh, congratulations on the great work you're doing as well at uh, your university. Thanks so much. And, and thank you to everybody who has joined us for this webinar, who have uh, asked questions and, and everybody who's tuned in. Uh, I hope that everybody uh, takes care, stays safe. And uh, until next time, see you later.